This is a Tibet House member video and is a part of the Force for Good class series, now available at tibethouse.us. So we're going to do a very, very simple like mindfulness of sounds and mindfulness of the breath. Like, like just the most simple, like almost doing nothing, okay? Which is what mindfulness is. It's almost doing nothing. Um, the, the best description that I found of, you know, like pithy meditation instruction came out of a book that's called The Heart of Buddhist Meditation by a Sri Lankan monk named Nyana Panika. Nyana Panika, if anyone's writing it down, N-Y-A-N-A-P-O-N-I-K-A. Nyana Panika, it means flowing towards wisdom. And then the last name is Thera or Tara, which just means elder. But he was really a German monk whose name was Sigmund Feniger, <laughs> who um, <laughs> left Berlin in the 30s and went to Sri Lanka. Uh, to study Buddhism. There was a, a, the first movement of Westerners uh, studying uh, Sanskrit and, and interested in Buddhism came, you know, before Hitler. Uh, the same kind of people who were studying with Freud. And um, uh, Feninger was one of them and he went to Sri Lanka and began to study Buddhism and then the, um, the Germans who owned uh, Sri Lanka in those days gathered up all the, uh, I mean the British, uh, who owned Sri Lanka, gathered up all the German nationals and put them in a camp in northern India during the war years uh, just to keep an eye on them. And uh, so there were, several, there were like three or four German monks there and they spent the war years translating Buddhist texts including the, this uh, Satipatthana Sutra. And, um, uh, and then uh, after the war, Nyanapanika went back to Sri Lanka and he founded a retreat center called, I think, the Island Hermitage. And he founded a publication, a press, called the Buddhist Publication Society. And he was really the, one of the first to begin to translate all of the Buddhist stuff um, into first German and then English. And I met him when I went my first trip to Asia. I went with Jack and Joseph um, <coughs> first to uh, Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha was enlightened, and then to um, Burma to Joseph's teacher's teacher and then to Thailand to Jack's teacher and then I went to Sri Lanka with a couple of friends and um, walked through the jungle and I met Jana Panika who was one of my heroes. He was an old, you know, German man still in his robes in the jungle there. I met him on the, like, outside in the jungle. I have no idea what, uh, if I had anything to say to him or what happened, but, um, but anyway, he's got the best definition of mindfulness which he called bare attention, which I like, like naked attention, bare attention. So we're giving just, that, that's why it's like almost like doing nothing, you know? We're giving just naked attention to whatever arises. And his definition was bare attention is the clear and single-minded awareness of what actually happens to us and in us at the successive moments of perception, okay? The clear and single-minded awareness of what actually happens to us and in us at the successive moments of perception. Just the bare facts, okay? Because the mind wants to get into it, you know? Oh, this is what's happening, let me talk about it, let me think about it, you know, let me, let me name it. Just the bare facts, so even like mindfulness of sounds, you know, like you'll hear a, or a, you know, and your mind will want to identify it, oh, that's a bell, you know, that's a bell. So it's not that we stop our mind from telling us what it is, even though we already know what it is, you know, that's a bell. But, but the bear, with bare attention, it's like you're going to keep listening to it. Your mind says, oh, that's a bell, what a nice ring. Oh, it's still going. Your mind will still talk. It doesn't stop talking, but... You know, 
just the bare facts. So you, you bring yourself back. A lot of the practice with mindfulness, especially you at mindfulness practice usually begins with mindfulness of the breath. So you try to, you try to like listen to the sound. Or you try to watch the breath and your mind will wander away from it. So, but mindfulness, at least at first, when you notice that your mind has wandered, you bring your attention back to whatever you've decided is the central object. Okay, so we could make the central object the sound. And if we're doing a John Cage kind of sound thing, then there's sound everywhere. There's no such thing as silence. So then we just listen, you know? And then if the sound is the central object, when your mind wanders, which it will do, it'll start talking about, oh, uh, you know, what am I going to do for dinner? Or this is, did I, am I listening to the sounds properly? Or what was that? As soon as you notice that you're not with the, what in Buddhism they call it the ear door, you know? The, the sense organ where the external world enters your nervous system. As soon as you notice that your mind has wandered, you deliberately bring your mind back. As if you're a good enough parent, you know, not scolding, you know, gently but firmly, you bring yourself back. So if the breath is the central object, which is the traditional way that it's taught, when you breathe in, you know that you're breathing in. When you breathe out, you know that you're breathing out. You do that in, out, feel the lips touching each other, touching, touching, in, out, when the mind wanders. When you notice that the mind has wandered, which might be immediately, or it might be several minutes later, it doesn't matter, you know, because that's just how it is. When you notice that the mind has wandered, then you gently but firmly bring yourself back. So it's the bringing yourself back over and over again that develops the muscle of mindfulness. But you have to be careful, like not too lax, like you don't just let it go and space out and fall asleep and daydream, unless you're super tired, in which case you can fall asleep, it's okay, you'll wake up. Um, but not too lax, but not too scolding, not too tense, okay? A lot of um, uh, type A, you know, good students, achievement-oriented, people when they start practicing meditation, they're, they're too tight with it, you know? And then, so they, they don't have that quality that I was stressing at the beginning of the, the young, soft, open, vulnerable, uncertain, you know, or even the, the gentle holding of the good enough parent. So it's with that, it's with that attitude. Okay, so the clear and single-minded awareness of what actually happens to us and in us at the successive moments of perception Okay. Just the bare facts, an exact registering. So it's, you're staying alert, okay, as much as is humanly possible. Allowing things to speak for themselves. So again, you know, with the sound, like... Allowing it to speak for itself, letting it come to you. That's another way, like you're settling back I think that's why the idea of placing mindfulness before you, it allows you to settle back. You're settling back, your experience comes to you. You don't have to be reaching out for it. So, as if seeing whatever it is or hearing whatever it is for the first time. So that's the idea of beginner's mind, you know? As if seeing it for the first time. So even your most boring, repetitive thoughts even the most familiar things, a, a sense of curiosity. There's a Japanese haiku, famous old overused Japanese haiku, uh, the old pond, a frog jumps in, plop. Okay, that's the essence of mindfulness. The old pond is your mind, frog jumping in, you know, could be the sound, could be your thoughts. Any, uh, any kind of sense object, plop, all the reverberations. You know, you're just sitting back, you're the old pond, you know, plop, it's all happening within.
Thanks for watching, and please be sure to like and subscribe to support the ongoing work of Tibet House US. Tashi Delect.